Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Steve Cross. Uh, thank you for joining me with this conversation with the journalist and writer and climate campaigner, Alice Bell, uh, one of the cleverest people I know. Uh, Alice is based in London. She co-runs the charity Possible. Uh, it's a climate change charity. Some of you might know by its old name, 1010. Uh, she used to be an academic. She taught on the Science Communication Masters at Imperial. She was part of Sussex's Science and Policy Research Unit. Uh, she worked at the City University Journal journalism school and uh, STS at UCL, where I'm still an honorary fellow, I think, probably Alice is as well. I think basically everybody who's ever written anything about science is an honorary fellow in science and technology studies. We're here to talk about Alice's new book, which I have with me, uh, Our Biggest Experiment, A History of the Climate Crisis. Um, any of you who are watching, you think I need a copy of that, I'm just going to hold the barcode up so that you can scan it directly from the screen. There we go. And you can get yourself a copy because it's wonderful. We're going to talk about some of the things that are in the book and some of the things that aren't in the book. Hello, Alice. Good morning. Good How afternoon. <laughs> Can't remember what time it is. I'm good. How are you? Uh, I am all right. Been doing a little bit too much childcare recently. Um, one of the many things that I'm doing to make the climate worse recently is uh, having twins. But um, they're twins, like you don't control whether that happens or not. It just happens. So I refuse to feel guilty for it. Um, first of all, love the book. Um, I love the fact that it's like really scholarly. There's no um, kind of unjustified. Uh, ranting in it, which is the way I would have written a book about climate change. Um, everything is brilliantly footnoted. It has a full reading list on every page for, if you enjoyed this, why not read the 2003? Love all of that. I love the fact it sounds like you all the way through because it's really kind and patient. Even when there are people doing things which, you know, you might think of as terrible, uh, you're still kind and patient and looking for the good side of them. And I just think that's a wonderful piece of writing. Um, we're going to have a chat about the book and about other things and about the climate. But I'd like to start, if it's all right, by asking you just the title of your previous book. Before we dive into the whole of Climate Crisis, your last book was called Can We Save the Planet? And um, can we? Ish. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I think I, I didn't choose that title. Uh, I think it's a good title because it is something that people often ask, but I think it's a very old fashioned way of thinking about the issue. I mean, I think yeah. um, it's a lot, it invites a lot of questions like, say, what does save mean and who would we be saving it for? What yeah. What is that? I think a better way of thinking about the problem that it's maybe touching or reflecting is, can we survive on this planet? with each other and can we do that without doing too much harm to other species and different i mean from a very deep green perspective you might come at it coming from a perspective of saying how can humans survive without hurting other species uh, and really think about kind of looking at the impact that humans have made on our planet aghast and appalled from maybe a slightly different perspective maybe a more kind of um human focused one, different ideological positions, religious positions, you might be thinking, well, all right, humans are a dominant species and maybe what we need to do is protect us, but we are part of a large ecosystem that we rely on these other, on all sorts of other things, food systems, other animals, um, and how can we survive? How can we live? Can we, how can we thrive on this planet uh, without disrupting those systems that we rely on? Um, and I think the answer to those questions, whether you're deep, deep green or kind of light green or or coming at it from a very pragmatic position of just wanting to mm. save humans um i think that we can but it'll take a lot of work and we have to appreciate that we have mm. done a huge amount of damage or oh, i say we this is a really problematic word and i kind of wondered with with this history book at one point i was going to try and write it without using any reference to the word we and I, I use it minimally because that suggests that we're all in it together and we're all doing the same mm. we're all having maybe the same impact and that's not true at all some humans are causing a huge amount of damage and yeah. some humans are causing very little uh, and that that's something that i think is vital that we all recognize when thinking about these problems and just for our viewers out there just so that you can uh, take part in this conversation wherever you are on the green spectrum that alice is talking about you can talk to us on twitter using hashtag rsa climate um, and we'll be there replying um that's amazing, Alice, that we are, so there's, there's a chance. I, I, I keep saying we over and over again. Yeah. Uh, it's your old book's title. So one of the, the, the impressions that I really got from the book is that um, 
we do have to do a lot of work and we've had lots of opportunities to start doing that work where it didn't seem to happen uh, and I was wondering if we could uh, if you had a, like one of those that you think is particularly instructive of the the willingness of the the people in control of these things to to stare at the work that needs doing and then somehow step away from it or around it would you mean just sort of go oh we need to do something and then actually hide and run away is that what you mean yeah because i i think that, that your book's full of really interesting points where um everything could have gone either way and it, i remember working on an exhibition about climate change 12 years ago and all the time thinking wow we really need to dig in and do a lot and not a huge amount has changed in that intervening period so as are there any of the points in the book where you think actually we could have started the work and it would have been much easier than doing it now. I mean, there are a lot. I sometimes think that people have been discovering the climate crisis uh, for about 150 years. And mm -hmm. every 10 to 15, 5 to 15 years, they kind of come at it and you get this wave of interest and concern and then it dies back again. Um, and I certainly, like just within my own lifetime, have sort of been very aware of three or four of those waves. I think they're coming at us even more frequently and with more intensity. They do tend to come up and then die down again. Um, and I think that, yeah, so you can see many points where it's kind of peaks. Sort of, you think, oh, maybe there could have been a bit of a more leverage faction then. Uh, and you can trace that back to kind of 1850s, really. Uh, but I'd say key ones happen in the last 30 to 40 years. And there was yeah. certainly a big wave in the late 80s um, where we see, we see people like Al Gore uh, when he made his first kind of run at going for the president standing talking about the greenhouse effect um, when we think about Al Gore is talking about climate change after he lost the election in the noughties but actually he'd been doing that since the early 80s um, mm. he'd first studied at university one of the pioneers of climate research had been one of his lecturers at university and he'd been really inspired and he'd done all sorts of work through the 80s and then talked about it in the election campaign at the end of that decade but even George H. Bush was saying at that election things like, oh, you've heard about the greenhouse effect. Well, let me tell you about the White House effect, kind of going, we're going to tackle this. Um, and Thatcher was standing up, uh, making yeah. big uh, international speeches and trying to sort of position Britain as a bit of a leader on climate change action. I think maybe she thought that the French were trying to get that game and she was play a bit of old classic British versus French diplomacy, thinking All right, we'll, we'll, we'll show ourselves as the science and diplomacy leaders of the world and not letting the French get this. Uh, um, I mean, there were lots of different reasons she might have done that. But then that, that did um, kind of fall back. And I think one of the things that's really illustrative of that is that it looked like we were going to take action and it looked like there was going to be a lot of change about how we used fossil fuels and the fossil fuel industry got scared. And previous to that, the fossil fuel industry had actually been one of the players in this, they'd sort of been talking about it, they'd been researching it. It's something that climate campaigners like to say a lot, you know, Shell knew, Exxon knew, they pull out these papers that were written by um, oil industry researchers going right back to the 1950s. Um, and it is, it's true that they were researching it. In fact, there was quite a large body of research funded by Exxon in the 80s. Um, but they got scared when they see people like, you know, even Thatcher and, and Bush talking about it. It's not just these sort of slightly marginal left-wing voices or weird green people that they kind of think they can dismiss. It, it's really mainstream uh, politicians who are, are aligned with business and they're thinking, oh, we have to do something. And then there's a pushback. Um, there's a great book about this, Merchants of Doubt, um, by Eric Conway and Naomi Oris, which talks about this in detail. It's only really a small part of my book. Um, and there's been a huge amount of investigative journalism done um, also in the last few years and looking through all of this. It's something that pe people are interested in. They can certainly Google and find out more about. But I'd say that point where it looked like we were going to take more action and there was a pushback. Um, and we've been dealing with different forms of those pushbacks ever since. And I think we're still also dealing with that delay that if we'd started then uh, we'd have less work to do and also we'd be further along the line. Mm. Fantastic. Well, I wanted to ask you specifically about this kind of shift in the thinking of what you might think of as the rights, because, you know, we tend to think of climate change as a progressive cause. Um, so what happened if, if George Bush and Thatcher were saying this is a thing that needs to be dealt with. And, you know, Thatcher was thinking about it in right wing terms. You know, this is a chance for capitalism. It's a chance for business. The market could solve these things. What happened? How did that side of politics lose touch with this as an issue? 
Well, it happened differently in different countries. I think it happened much more obviously in the States than it did in the UK. And I think that uh, certainly the British Conservative Party would would say that they're on the side, they are very green and that they mm. are echoing. They, they, I mean, they changed over the years, different people have had different takes on it. There was certainly the, there was the hug a, a hugger husky phase with Cameron. And then there was a bit of a, I think a lot of uh, people saw green action as being very a Cameron thing and then yeah. didn't want to look like that because they didn't want to align with Cameron. And it's sort of been read like Gove then made it his own and, and mm. Johnson has his own take on it. You know, there's different waves and, and this is, it's been more or less interesting to different political parties at different times. But I think they'd see themselves sort of in the same kind of uh, mold as what Thatcher was saying often. And they're yeah. often will reference her um and i think there's a lot to say there's a lot of interactions between the green movement broadly which is not necessarily the same as climate change campaigning but the green movement and british conservatism in fact in many ways the green movement is quite conservative um uh, and there's a lot of you know, groups like wwf which were launched in 1961 at the royal society of arts <laughs> well, well there we go first rsa reference we've got in. <laughs> um by prince philip you know, like these are these are not uh, left wing radicals. These mm. are actually quite establishment figures, and there's lots of ways in which the green movement in the UK is very establishment and remains so. Um, but uh, you know, part of the tactics that people took in the late 80s when they were thinking, right, how can the people who wanted to keep us stuck on fossil fuels, thinking how can we keep us stuck on fossil fuels? One of the tactics they took was to kind of own the right wing discourse, particularly in the States. And they spent a lot of money on that. And I think in the US, we're now seeing uh, a range of different uh things happening and changing with, with climate change. But one of them is that a bit more of, again, of a rediscovery on, on the right about talking about climate change. Mm. Um, I definitely, I don't think that it's, it's, I think it's something that people often sort of label it a left-wing thing. And I think that's often a tactic to dismiss it. Uh, mm. to, so, so people who don't identify as left-wing go, oh, I don't want to be part of this. Uh, mm. But actually it isn't. And if you, like a lot of climate campaigners, well, if you look at climate campaigning, it is very ideologically diverse. There is a, a left-wing area and there's an area of left-wing politics, which is very, energized by climate change but if you look at actually people who are working in climate change it's very very diverse and there's a very range of different ideological takes um and i mean thatcher one of the things that's really interesting about thatcher is i think she saw that to take action on climate change we would need radical social and economic change and she knew that that was going to be an opportunity for the left and i think that's an opportunity that the left have taken uh, and made a lot of in the last few decades saying like we need change. This is it's a big kind of um, strap line of a lot of, of kind of eco-socialist campaigning is kind of mm. um, look, the environment is the example or, or people just use it from the, people who don't even necessarily are that engaged with climate change. They're coming pure, much more from a, a ideological left position. Going, this is why we need to have socialism is because of climate change. This is kind of used as a banner, like look at mm. what capitalism is doing to the planet. Um, and I think Thatcher could see that they'd have that opportunity. And so she wanted to own it because she thought, like, if we're going to have change, she wanted change to be written on her terms. And I, I, I mean, in some ways, I think that's one of the things we lost, as well as many decades of, of action on climate change. We also lost that big fight, which I think we still need to have a bit, which is that um, we do need to change our society radically. So on what terms are we going to, to do that? Because at the moment, we're still a bit kind of having a fight about whether we do it or not, rather than what does it look like? Uh, and one of the things that, that keeps me awake at night is not just that we don't tackle climate change, is that we tackle it, but we have some real bad people in control of how we tackle it. And we actually re we create even more social and economic problems and divides for ourselves in society because of the way we're tackling it, not just mm. that we don't do it. Could you just expand for us how um, the ways that we're tackling climate change are worsening equality and things like that? Well, there's all sorts of ways in which sort of tackling climate change badly can have uh, not just economic, uh, environmental problems, but uh, economic ones. So, for example, there's big life lights fights in the green movement about different types of um, uh, types of renewable energy. Uh, do we invest in tidal energy? There's lots of green activists who do not want us to invest in uh, tidal energy uh, because they're worried about how it might affect uh, marine biodiversity. But at the other side, you've got the more kind of carbon focused climate campaigners are like well you know what kills marine biodiversity climate change kills marine biodiversity same thing with wind positioning of wind turbines generally groups like the rspb are very pro winds they have a wind turbine at their hq and they're very keen to emphasize that they're not about to be used by the anti-wind lobby but they will also i think quite rightly considering what their agenda is argue against the siting of some wind turbines because it might affect bird life um 
you've got those fights, but you've also got things like a phenomenon called green grabbing. I think it was John Vidal at The Guardian who first coined this term. It sort of comes from the last few decades. Um, and it's the process of people in the West wanting to buy things like offset. So you, 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 fly, a, you fly on your plane, and you feel guilty about it. So you, you offset it and you think, oh, I'll just get some trees planted in another part of the world. Uh, but you don't necessarily think about which part of the world is going to have to have those trees planted in it and whose land it is. And so you get land grabbing where people um, kind of take other people's land, but done for green reasons. Um, and what, the classic example I use, sort of, particularly when I'm sort of, it's a seminar, it's a good sort of seminar discussion thing for, for students and stuff, or just to scare young uh, campaigners is um, pressure being put on um, uh, d- digital tech g- groups, for example, Bitcoin miners, but even less a niche than that, just of people who are using a lot of energy because of, of digital technologies. Pressure for them to decarbonize. They're like, oh, we'll buy loads of solar and wind. And they buy it in uh, land at Western Sahara. Um, which is occupied land and they, they're playing into what, what they're doing is they're just sort of nest, what, what can be done is renewables can be cited in particular land as a way of kind of citing claim on that land. And somebody who's mm. thinking, oh, I'm just doing a good thing because I'm decarbonizing can be played, can be pulled into these fights over, over land rights and, and those sorts of things. It's really important that we, we are aware of and we don't just do, we don't just think, oh, offsetting is good or renewables are good because, who owns them? Who, who are you giving economic power mm. to here? And whose land is it on? And presumably, while um, people who are interested in climate change are arguing about what the best thing to do is, that plays into the hands of people who are arguing for a delay for other reasons. Oh, yeah, all the time. I mean, that's sort of... Uh, it's, uh, and I think it's one of the reasons why climate campaigners can be a bit defensive and they don't talk about mm. their problems. So, I mean, it's really vital that uh, we do have these conversations about how we do renewables, where we put it, what other, you know, do we want to invest in other technologies, um, you know, things like um, geoengineering and who, who would be affected by those things. Um, or just stuff like, um, it's a big thing that I think is really important people are honest about, but things like um, mining for uh, metals for batteries and and how, uh, you know, what, what that does to economic, not what that does environmentally, but also what how that plays into social and economic and political problems around wherever this is mined. I know there was a controversy recently about um, solar panels. And so one of the things about solar panels in the last few decades is their price has dropped massively. And it's partly because mm. of huge amounts of work done in China. And there was uh, some journalism done recently which unpacks like well some of these solar panels in china are being produced in labor practices which are not necessarily that great you know maybe we will come to a point where we have like fair trade solar i'd like us to be in a position where we don't need to have a special certification for fair trade solar just because all solar is produced in ways that uh, are not exploiting people but um you know these these are things that it's important i think the climate campaigners and community talk about and, and are open about uh, rather than just kind of hiding because uh, it can be very easy to be quite defensive when you're under attack for even the smallest little thing that, that might mm. seem a bit bad. Yeah, it's, it's, even now I see articles written with just arguing for no action to be taken about climate change because magically something will save us all. It's usually fusion power. Um, and it was, uh, the, one of the ways I tried to explain it is that it's slightly strange to say deus ex machina as a piece of science policy. And it's also weird to put all of your eggs into one basket, especially when that wa- one basket doesn't work yet and has shown no signs of working. Um, I wanted to just uh, pivot us to a slightly lighter element for a moment. So as soon as this event was announced, obviously, I went straight to the book and looked up the RSA. Um, you don't mention the, the launch of uh, WWF in there, but you do mention another quite funny RSA story. And I was wondering if you could just bring that to life to us, for us, and uh, contextualise it in the kind of timeline of the book. Oh, people giving presentations at the RSA, they're all terrible, <laughs> uh, including us. Um, no, well, yeah, there's, I mean, there's, the, there's WWF, which... Is it a wonderful and amazing and inspiring, but also kind of, you know, not without it, reasons to be critical of organisation. And certainly, like, it was set up by very much people in power, like people like Prince Philip. Um, yeah. And I, there's a lot of interesting stories about the setting up of that and reasons to kind of look again at the Green Movement, I think, because of that. But the other, the other one, I think the one you're referring to is... Um, just a, a speech given by um, the head of the Met Office in the 1970s, 
John Mason. Um, the sort of thing that some, you know, a leading scientist would do, give a great talk at the Royal Society. And it was, I found it because it was written up in Nature by um, science writer John Gribben. Um, um, and he just wrote up this, this article reviewing a presentation that had been given by head of the Met Office about this thing that people were starting to talk a little bit more about, which was climate change and whether we should be worried. And uh, John Gribben is kind of like, no reason to panic, no, no real reason to worry yet. And one of the reasons I was looking at Nature articles about this issue was that the editor of Nature, John Maddox, um, had written um, several books and, and pe- uh, papers and editorials kind of saying environmentalists are just panicking and they the, this is a silly distraction and they should just calm down. He'd been very critical, particularly of, of Silent Spring and stuff about pesticides. Mm. Um, and it's sort of, in retrospect, you now look at it, you wonder why, why is there a big prize for standing up for science named after John Maddox because there's a lot of things that he sort of kind of got wrong and kind of almost bullied people anyway he was very much a a voice of I think he had good reason for it you know there's this context behind all of this too but you know he's a big voice for kind of like don't worry your silly little heads about climate change and I was noticing this in nature and read back so I went and looked at the the piece by um in the, there's a there's a full write up in the papers of the RSA of this of this speech by John Mason and he's he's one of these I think in the 1970s, there was still quite a live debate within meteorology about how much people needed to be worried about climate change. There was sort of this old guard, like as is natural in science, there was an old guard that kind of needed to be sort of, well, maybe it's unfair to say needed to be pushed aside, but we're going to gradually die out and new voices were, were coming in. Um, there were good reasons why people were sceptical or of why you might be concerned about climate change. Um, and there was a lot more research to be done. And there was also a big fight about whether whether global cooling was actually more of a problem and how much global cooling was happening, how much global warming was happening and that kind of thing. And so he was he was part of that. But I mean, it, you look back at it now and you go, you really are an old fart that needed to get on. <laughs> and you, but he's, he's acknowledging that um, climate change is happening and would happen. And if, if, if things weren't changing, then we might have a degree or so of global warming um, mm. by the 21st century, which we're now living in because there wasn't much action taken on it. But it was very much like, don't, don't worry, don't worry about this, don't worry about this. Um, and it's, it's, there's a, a really nice line in a paper by John Agar, a uh, historian mm. at, at UCL. He was looking at some of these discussions and he found a quote from a uh, uh, scientific advisor Solly Zuckerman who said John Mason was never very good at looking at the future which is such an incredible burn when you're talking about the guy who runs the Met Office so basically the, uh, the weather forecasting you know <laughs> and I'm sure that uh, Zuckerman knew exactly how much of a burn he was uh, it's a really lovely example of scientists being quietly quite bitchy um, but yeah John Mason wasn't very good at looking at the future he did then leave not long after that and his successor was was much more kind of I, gung-ho is maybe not the word, but much more into sort of really like saying we need to talk about climate change. It was one of the people who was briefing Thatcher and one of the reasons why Thatcher was talking in a very different way from some of her predecessors about climate change. Fantastic. And um, so we still hear similar things from some senior scientists, you know, you don't have to worry about this. Uh, and I was just wanting to ask you, because clearly not not everybody who um, kind of downplays the danger of climate change is doing it because they've been funded by oil lobby or anything like that. I wanted to ask you, is there, is there a strand of naive credulity? It's the, uh, the opposite of incredulity, which is what we normally talk about, um, of the science establishment in, in this thinking. Are there a bunch of people who are like, things are generally fine, and I'm going to argue for th- that things are generally fine, so people let me get on with what I want to do? I think there's a lot of different pressures on scientists to say different things. And I think, yes, some of that maybe is, is, especially if you look back at some of the things people have said in the past, I think climate scientists in particular are a lot more politically savvy these days, but... Um, you know, people in the past um, it might it might have kind of been influenced by by people who they shouldn't have been influenced by or made the wrong decisions. Like it's very easy for us to sit here in twenty twenty one and look back and go, hey, you shouldn't have said that. And you're like, well, they were living in a very different time and they had to, they didn't have all the advantages of knowing how the world was going to run out was going to play out. Mm. Um, I think one thing that I think really came home to me while I was researching the book was um, how many of the so, well, quite often I'd have these arguments with climate campaigners the last sort of 10 years or so where they'd say, oh, you, Alice used to work in science and why is it scientists haven't been screaming? Why have they not been screaming out, telling us all to do stuff? And the answer is some of them were and you just weren't listening. Um, and the other thing is that some of the, I think quite rightly, they didn't want to scare people. 
And there's sort of, um, there was a particular, there's a guy called Roger Revelle, who's a really key character in the book and in, in the history of understanding mm. climate change. He was one of the people who first set up some of the first sort of climate science research that was funded to study climate change, as opposed to just people doing it when they were looking at other things and kind of going, oh, whoops, what's this I found? Um, uh, and was the, the guy who taught Al Gore and inspired Al Gore. And he, he um, there's, a, there's a line from him in, in the early 80s where he, he's, he's, part of a big report from the National Science Foundation that's briefing the world about climate change. And he said, we're, we're sounding an amber light, not a red one. And this was written up in places like the Washington Post. It's like, don't worry, again, a bit like John Gribben and John, uh, Maddox in um, Nature going, don't worry. And I don't think he meant it like that. I think what he meant was more, we've still got an opportunity to change. You know, this is 1981. Like, we've still got a chance to, to not really mess it up. And he's being quite hopeful. And he said very similar things in, just before he died in the early 90s. He said, you know, it's not necessarily going to be that bad. And this was taken by the, by the early 90s. You had the sort of forces of climate skepticism out ready to capture anything that any scientist said and twist them. And this was, it became quite a big controversy actually in the 90s because it was then used to attack Al Gore, an idea that he was a climate skeptic and that we didn't need to worry. But I think, I mean, it's hard to tell because he's dead. But if you look at kind of what people, his friends said and his family said and things, you look at it and you think, I, I think to a kind of and at one point I was like, I really how how could he be so stupid? And like, actually maybe I should be a bit more generous to him, a bit more fair on him. What he was trying to say is look, we've still got an opportunity to act. And hmm. particularly in the last sort of few years, we've seen there was this line that came up after the IPCC a couple of years ago, three years ago, had this big report on um whether we could hit 1.5 degrees, whether we would uh, go, was it possible to keep to 1.5 degrees global warming? It came up after the Paris Accord was agreed. One of the things they did was they asked the IPCC to write this report. It came out a few years ago. It's one of the things that really sparked a lot of the XR stuff and really gave a lot more power to, to the climate, uh, use climate strikes and stuff. Um, and one of the, when, when that came out, there was this headline of 10 years to save the world. And what, this was a kind of just, it was, it wasn't really a twisting of what they said. It was more just, it's the nature of, of how science makes its way into the, into the wider world. You know, they said something and it gets moved slightly. It sort of gets moved and moved and moved. And, uh, it became a headline, kind of maybe regrettably, but understandably, this sort of 10 years to save the planet meme has sort of emerged. Mm. And this gets, so I get, me and I, I've talked to other climate, climate people, sort of climate scientists who say they have this when they give talks. People come up to them and go, are we all going to die in 10 years time? And is, actually, is this, does this mean we've only got eight years? Are, are my children actually going to, you know, like have no future at all? Like, no, it's not. Like, this is a, a window of opportunity that we still have to be able to keep things sort of to a point where they're a bit more livable. Um, mm. And I think it's very difficult. It's something I certainly feel as a climate campaigner, it's really difficult to, to walk that line about like, do you say um, it's all going to be terrible and scare people or, or do you try and reassure them? But then does that end up making it sound like, oh, it's all right. I don't need to worry about it. You can keep flying. It's fine. And I, I think it's that's where maybe um, there's been some of the problems and things have been twisted. And I think that although in retrospect, you look back on stuff and you go, you order will pull your hair out, going like, why are you being so complacent? I think that was one of the things they were coming from. Um, the other thing is, I think very understandably, a lot of them were saying, well, there are other problems that we need to be dealing with. Like I read, read some stuff from some of the scientists in the 60s. And they're like, yeah, I care about climate change, but I'm more worried about air pollution. I'm like, well, mm. that's fair enough. That was where John Maddox was coming from. I mean, to be fair on John Maddox, some, some, some of the things I read, you read some of his stuff and you're like, oh, God such a reactionary old fart but i think what he was trying to do is push a load of people who he felt were go worrying about abstract things in the future and up in the atmosphere and he was like well look at all this injustice already happening on the ground he felt it was a sort of um, thing that middle class people were doing to wring their hands about something in the future when they should have been dealing with stuff in the, in the present and I, I get that as a criticism and i think that um I think that's sort of understandable that, that scientists have kind of taken some of those positions. So it's, it's, it's tricky. It's, I want to be able to point my finger and go, look at that person over there saying this terrible mm -hmm. thing. Scientists are ridiculous. But actually, I think often they've just been dealing with a very tricky situation. And it is, it's, nobody knows what the right thing to say is. I mean, I, my assumption is as well that um, why aren't scientists screaming about this? Partly because you don't get ahead in the world of science by being a screaming person. You've got to be a nice, clubbable person. That can that, I mean, that is part of it. At... Yeah, I mean, yeah, you have to be clubbable. You have to be nice. You, have to, mm. you know, it doesn't do you good to, to upset these people. But more than that, I think it's, it's not just that. It's sort of 
a way of presenting yourself. And that was definitely a very live fight in the 70s. I think we've seen that in every decade since too, as sort of scientists that stick their head out a bit are seen as not scientific. And I think that's a, that's a norm of the scientific community, which has done them a lot of good at times, but actually when it comes to climate change is maybe one that is, uh, has not done them good. And we should at least appreciate that is a norm and it is a, a cultural trend and a cultural approach, which actually does skew the science a bit. Now, sometimes it's skewed it for good reasons, but it's, 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 a, it's a thing that is, is uh, shaping how we perceive, perceive science and how we do science. And like any social force that shapes science, we should at least be aware of it and question whether it's a useful thing or not. Alice, you talked at the beginning about waves of worrying about climate change. And um, I'd like to ask you, really, where are we now? Because with COP26 coming up, uh, there's a lot of climate change in the news, but there's an awful lot more COVID in the news. And um, do things like COVID knock climate change enthusiasm back down? I thought it was, you know, like um, a few years ago, in the before times, uh, so it must have been about three years ago now, maybe. Mm. I had there was this dinner for, by this w woman who works very senior in PR uh, in the UK, and she decided that climate change was a thing, and she got a load of us climate campaigners together. It was me and a scientist, and a, another couple of campaigners, and somebody who worked in uh, policy, and we sort of had dinner, and she sort of we talked, to, we gave her our advice, and she gave her us hers. And one of the things she said was, she said, "You are riding high in public interest. People care about climate, and it's, it's growing and growing and growing. But you've only got another six months, and then it's going to drop." And I thought, "She's right. You know, we've seen it. I've seen it with these waves. I definitely remember it in the mid nineties, mid naughty, mid nineties, and the mid noughties. You know, the big wave on the run up to Copenhagen, and then pff, dropped. And I was, we're all just kind of waiting for that drop." And I was like, how can we keep, can we extend this six months to like just another year? Can we eke it out so we get to the Glasgow talks, which were meant to be initially in the end of 2020, yeah. not because not, they got delayed by a year by COVID. And then it got to Easter and it happened and we got to, and COVID happened. And I was like, this is it. This is like after Copenhagen and the Copenhagen talks crashed. And then the, it wasn't just that they crashed and then people felt disappointed. It was that the economic downturn came out, came along and took all the attention away as well. It was these two mm. sort of things happening together. And um, this is this is what it is, isn't it? Bye. All right. It was it was it was it was good. People were paying attention to me for a brief period, and it'll go back yeah. to the hard look. And and it, then it didn't. People still were interested in climate change, and like climate campaigners, I think deliberately went really really quiet at first because we thought like no one wants to hear about us. Like it'd be just crass for us to be like, and the. The, front, the world's still burning and people are like, yes, we're dying tomorrow, please. You know, we didn't want to be out doing that. Uh, we certainly didn't want to be saying things like, look, there's no flying or cars. Isn't that great? Because people are like, no, this is not for the right reason. We weren't, nobody mm. was going to be out doing that. I mean, that's certainly not the way we wanted, you know, carbon emissions dropped. That's certainly not the way we wanted carbon emissions to drop because we know that long term actually probably end up rising if you do it in a bad way. And but then it was clear that the public still had an appetite for that. If anything, I think the, the general public have kind of pulled out the climate discourse from the climate campaigners. We, you know, we were sitting there being a bit quiet and then going, oh, actually, they want to talk to us about this. And if you look in the UK in this, but this is a trend that is something you can see in, in many countries around the world. Not only did a concern about climate change stay, stay, stay sort of, uh, in, in, like, let, it, not only did it not drop, it actually increased only a little bit. But, but still, I mean, that, that is remarkable. And it's really heartening for me to feel like we're on a wave that isn't dropping. And, and maybe we've got to a point where it's not going to drop back. And maybe I'm just being ridiculously hopeful. But like, I feel like we've spent all this time studying these waves that are going up and down and up and down and up and down. You know, and it kind of goes, it's a bit like this famous graph here, um, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, um, where it goes up over time, but it goes up and down and up and down. It's called the Keeling curve. And it goes up and down and up mm. and down because it's the seasons breathing in the uh, it's um, the, the foliage in the northern hemisphere breathing carbon dioxide in and out as it falls back with the seasons. And it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. But overall, the trend is up. And I kind of feel like that's how we do, uh, how our interest in climate change has gone. It's kind of gone up and down. But maybe we are just going up. Maybe, for, maybe, maybe our interest in climate change will actually be able to kind of keep up with carbon emissions and we may finally do something about it. Maybe all those forces that have been beating us down each time mm. have finally died out. Um, or maybe I'll be proved wrong in a year's time, it will be dead again. So, I mean, theoretically, if we plotted out the interest in climate activism in your book across time, does it form the shape of a hockey stick? Roughly? No, I think it looks more like the Keeling curve, which is up and down and up and down, but going up. Um, 
Whereas a hockey stick is the temperature levels, which are like uh, yeah. this is this is graph nerding for anyone who doesn't know. Uh, I'm just I, I just control. brought up the hockey stick just to really enrage any hardcore climate skeptics who are watching this. For, um, for people who haven't been following rather boring arguments in climate skepticism for the last few decades, hockey stick is the name of a graph that shows global temperatures over time. So it's kind of roughly level and then goes up uh, like a hockey stick. Um, and there's lots of fights around it. Okay, so let's for a moment think that um, climate change activism survived COVID. It didn't drop off. This is a positive time. Now that we've recorded this conversation, uh, newspaper editors watching it will realise that they've been publishing thinly disguised uh, climate change delay arguments as if they were um, good faith scientific thinking. They'll stop doing all of that. Um, if this And your book is full of pivot points, points where people... The, people could have started the work that needs to be done and they didn't start the work that needs to be done but let's for a moment be optimistic and assume this is this is the pivot point where everything pivots the right way what do the people watching this need to do and think and say to help this be the moment where things i'm not saying it's all down to you alice in the end you know we've been looking for goodies throughout this i'm not saying it all comes down to alice bell being the cause of all of this but for the people who are watching what do they do and think and say to help this be the point where we pivot the right way we can't let it drop and um we have to appreciate that we have to do a lot of work we have been left in a really difficult position um, mm. because it hasn't been done. And there's other pivot points or not enough has been done. We have to decarbonize. At, like people talk about tackling climate change as our moonshot. And that is rubbish. It is nothing as small as putting a person on the moon. <laughs> and I know this sounds terrifying and it, it is. And it's one of the things that I think climate campaigners shy away from saying how incredibly big it is. But the thing is that if we don't do this, we have the even bigger change. Like change is coming, whether we want it or not. It's going to come from the skies and the soils and the seas, or it's going to come from us. And so we need to make sure it comes from us. And we need to, to do everything we can. So that will mean putting pressure on your politicians. But it's not, you know, there are some climate campaigners that will be like, you just need to write a letter to your politician. I'll give us some money and we'll bully the politicians. Yeah, do those things. Write to your politicians. Give climate campaigners a bit of money. But know that that is not all you can do. You will, we, will, we live, you know, anyone watching this, I'm going to guess probably it has a very high carbon footprint. Now, you might think mm -hmm. that you have, you know, you don't have to be, a, you don't have to be Bill Gates to do it, to have a very high carbon footprint. You just need to live, be reasonably wealthy in a reasonably wealthy country. And we're going to have to change our lifestyles a lot. Um, we will need politicians to help us do that. Like, it's not something that we can all just go out and do on our own. Or, or would it would be appropriate for us to do that. We need to work together and we also need political change to do that. But there are also things that we can just do in our everyday lives. Like think, do we need to fly to one holiday? No. Do we need to eat meat every day? No. And we need to make those decisions, but also not just sit there smugly and go, I've given up me. Ha. But make sure it's something you talk about. And it's something that um, we've got to stop being shy greens. Now, it's something I know I'm really guilty of myself um, is that I will like I'm going to a wedding later this year for a family member who lives in Spain. And so we're going to go by train because I don't want to fly. And I'm not going to say everyone, you know, I, I, I did the last time they did this. I just didn't bother saying, you know, occasionally people went, I heard you took the train. And I go, oh, yes. And I kind of hide about it. No, I need to actually say, yes, I took the train. It was great. We stopped here. We did this. And it was really good. And think about all those carbon emissions I saved and say I'm doing it for climate change. Not do it in a way that's wagging my finger and telling off people who flew, but just say, say that I did it and say why I did it and be enthusiastic about that because that'll help change norms and we know from research there's a researchers who look at the social psychology of climate change and how people uh, change their behavior at places like particularly in cardiff there's a researcher who's looked at um steve westlake who's looked at how people talk about flying and he's found that if people if you give up flying for environmental reasons and you tell your friends that that's what you've done they are also more likely to cut their flying and support political change so if we're going to have the change at the speed that we need to have we need political levers business leader economic levers all these other things but we also need cultural change and we can all play a role in that cultural change just by talking about it um, and that will have spin-offs in other people's behavior but also in political areas and so yeah we all just need we need to we need to appreciate that it's going to be a dramatic change and we can't be passive in that we can't just sit there and go oh well, the politicians are going to tell us what to do or the leaders are going to tell us what to do we all need to play a role in that um and it would have, yeah it would have been a lot easier if we did it in 1981 but we don't live in 1981 we live in 2021 so uh, we need to get a move on. 
And I love the idea that every little bit of change, the kind of change that uh, people who don't want to change can look at and go, well, that makes no difference because of the one million factories opening in China every 30 seconds or whatever numbers they come out with. Um, actually, every little change is part of advertising that change yeah. is needed and you're going through change. As long as you know, like this often people talk about the little things and they go, oh, well, if we only do a little, we won't do a lot, uh, which is true. But if you only do a little, then you won't do a lot. But we do also need to do those little things. So that's not to say that you can just, you know, give up meat one day and think I've done my bit. <laughs> but it does mean that you need to do a lot of those little things. And they do have impact. They have they can have very powerful impact. But you just you do need to do a lot of a lot of them. Um, yeah. So I think, yeah, I think let's uh, I think it's a bit of reclaiming the little things a bit, but appreciating that we need to do them in a big way. That's a brilliant. If you can't even do the little things, you're definitely not going to do the big things. Yeah, that's um, true. That's true. As I as I reminded uh, the organisers of a conference I worked on a few years ago, a climate change and international development conference where they served beef at every meal. I was like, I don't think we're doing this right. Mm -hmm. um, fantastic. Thank you so much, Alice, for giving us uh, this chunk of your day to uh, tell us all about the, the stuff you've been thinking about. I want to remind you all of a couple of things. The first one is if you want to hear more of Alice, and I have to say, Alice's writing sounds exactly like Alice is talking. That's one of the great things about the book. Do get Our Biggest Experiment, uh, History of the Climate Crisis. You can also get Can We Save the Planet? Um, which I haven't read for this, so I don't have the whole thing in my mind. Um, and also, got the, RSA the wonderful written, thing is, oh, look, there you go. There we go. Um, um, edited by uh, Matthew Taylor, former uh, oh, editor. Of course, of course, he's off doing something else now. Um, I also wanted to say, if you want to keep thinking about these things, do keep an eye on the RSA's Regenerative Futures programme, because they're putting on a whole load more events, generating more reports and those sorts of things on ideas like this, especially in the run up to COP26. Um, so you can kind of get more of the arguments, more of the understanding. And uh, while you're there, you can, of course, lobby the RSA to make sure that they don't serve meat in any of their internal catering. Um, I'd like to thank you again for doing this, Alice. It's been super, super, super fun. Um, if people want to find more about you online, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Alice Bell, which mm -hmm. enrages all the other Alice Bells. Um, and also you can check out what my charity does. Uh, we're called Possible and our, we are called We Are Possible on bits of the internet, our uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook and our website. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Alice. Thanks to you all for watching. Thanks to everybody who's been tweeting along with this. Uh, I've been Steve Cross. This has been loads of fun.